No, no objection. Seeing, seeing no objection. Um, in my R, say no doubt. <clears throat> I call the meeting to order. Good evening, Exeter. Good evening, members of the board, uh, town staff. Uh, this is the town of Exeter, June 1st, 2020 select board meeting. Um, as the chair of the select board, I'm invoking the provisions of RSA 91-A colon 2, 3B, uh, as the uh, spread of COVID-19 continues, uh, as a board, we will be meeting uh, without a physical quorum. Uh, we are all uh, off-site, um, and we will be um, conducting the meeting again without the quorum. Uh, the select board does welcome members of the public accessing the meeting uh, to offer public comment. Uh, we ask that um, the public continue to maintain uh, the um, usual co code of conduct and decorum. Uh, all votes tonight will be taken via roll call from the clerk. And I will start by introducing the board. Uh, when I introduce you, if you would, uh, just say whether or not you are alone in the room, and if not, uh, with whom you're uh, in company. Uh, we'll start with the Vice Chair, Molly Cowan. Good evening, everybody. I am in my house by myself. Good evening. Select Woman Roundtree Olaf. Hey, good evening, everyone. I am home and temporarily by myself, but there might be a walker by. Great. Good evening. Selectman Brown. Good evening. I am alone. Okay. And our clerk, select woman, Julie Gilman. Has Julie joined the meeting? Okay. We'll introduce her when she, when she um, joins the meeting. We also have with us town manager, Russ Dean. Good evening. Our recording secretary, Joanna Bartell. And members of town staff that will be participating in the meeting later on. Uh, first item of business tonight is the board interview um, of Nina Braun. Nina, welcome. Third time is a charm. <laughs> and uh, Nina has uh, applied uh, to serve on the Communications Advisory Committee. Um, I know Nina well from uh, her work on the Sustainability Advisory Committee. Uh, so Nina, I'll give you an opportunity to just tell us about your extensive background and um, why you're interested in serving the town on the Communications Advisory Committee. Um, sure. So my um, professional background is within PR and corporate communications and marketing. Um, I've held various roles with different types of companies, um, technology, healthcare, consumer packaged goods um, for the past 20 some odd years. And um, with my work on the sustainability committee for the past year, I've gotten involved in the communications aspect of the committee and how we can um, sort of address the need of informing the community as to what exactly we're doing and how they can get involved and so forth. Um, so in doing that, in that whole process and creating a, trying to create a social avenue, um, you know, utilizing social means like Facebook and also trying to create a website or a web page, um, realizing that there was a need um, for more of a communication plan um, with committees. And then I was directed to the communication committee and it was suggested that I apply, which I did. And that brings me to here. Well, of course, through our work with the Sustainability Advisory Committee, um, since the early stages of that committee being formed, um, you've been very vocal about how um, uh, communications could improve between committees. And I know uh, outside of the, the official town committee, you've done some work on Facebook with another organization promoting sustainability. So um, as I said, I know you very well. I'd like to give um, the rest of the board an opportunity to ask questions. Um, Select Woman Gilman has, has joined us. Good evening, Julie. Good evening. And are you alone in the room? I am at home and I am alone, yes. Terrific. Do you think my, my, my deal will come out, will come, will work in the sunroom? Uh, 
Yes. May I ask who that is, please? I, I think that was Darren. So okay. I just, I just we, muted them out. Muted, please? Sorry, guys. I was muted. I wasn't muted. Okay. Uh, Nina, I did have a question. Uh, could you sort of walk us through your, your assessment of social media, um, traditional media, what, like the spread of um, how you would approach that from a town perspective? Uh, from the perspective of public forums, private companies, all that. So. Um, sure. So I think from um, a town perspective, it would definitely be more of a grassroots effort. Um, but stemming from the fact that um, I would create a communication plan that would address all committees' needs. Um, and I, I believe there has been a study done by a um, UNH grad student um, on communication means for the town of Exeter. Um, it was completed in January. So I would take that as a, as a starting point um, and then work it out as far as um, a concise plan. Um, and within that plan, it would not only include social media, um, but use of the town website, um, other communication means, whether that's direction on us to um, writing press releases, um, communication pieces, whether it's letters um, that need to be written, um, you know, to various different um, leaders and, and um, political groups. Um, things along that line, I, I just, I, I'm not aware of, and I know that the communications committee has been working on this, um, of a concise and complete plan that different committees can follow. Um, being that the sustainability committee is a new committee, um, like Nico said, so we've been um, around now for a year. Um, and so we're just, we're all trying to figure out um, the different means and what, what does it mean to... Um, you know, get things done and, and how do you communicate with the general town? Um, so that's what my plan would really focus on how to, how to get the best communication out to um, the community members. Also, um, during precedence of times and the fact that this came upon us without, you know, much planning or anything, um, but the whole way that we're communicating these days with digital and, and Zoom meetings and, and so forth, there really is, is, you know, that everybody's just sort of working um, by the seat of their pants and some committees I know are not even meeting um, at this time. So having that in place to, I think, an emergency sort of plan and, and what that means going forward. Um, utilizing, definitely utilizing the town website as much as we can um, for the community, for the committees. Um, and then as far as Facebook, I know that um, that being the, the most relevant means of social um, communication. So really creating a plan within that plan, I would address the um, the, the different means of, you know, obviously there would be certain rules and, and expectations, and that would be clearly laid out um, in this plan and how, how you would go about um, utilizing a social media site like Facebook. Um, I think a lot of cleanup also, I, my understanding is that there's several um, different Facebook pages that are related to the town, upwards of maybe 10 or, or more. Um, so definitely a cleanup on that um, and, and really more of an assessment and working with, you know, obviously what has been or what is being done already. Um, I mean, the communications committee has been around for quite a while. So I would assume that um, there are things in place that I could contribute to. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Any other questions of Nina? Sure. Um, I'll offer a suggestion. So the, the uh, communications committee is actually pretty new. Um, and one of the things that I've long been pushing is a survey to be done with people, um, which, you know, during the time of coronavirus, we might need to rethink how we do it. But I really think that 
the town needs to be asked where they are, which might be going to people's homes, not during the time of coronavirus. But, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in knowing from our constituents and our community is what kind of information they want and how they want it. Because oftentimes, you know, social media doesn't reach everybody. Not everybody's on Facebook. Not everybody thinks to look at the website. So where are people um, and how do they want information and what kind of information do they want? So that's something that I consider. I think your qualifications are excellent to serve on the committee. I'm excited that there is uh, there's an appetite for continuing this important work that I think that they're doing. Um, and I also think that there's a need to be nimble and, you know, adjust to the needs of the town and the needs of the time. So thank you for stepping up to serve. Thank you. I, I agree with you on the uh, different outlets of communication. I don't think that um, social media is necessarily the end all be all of all communication. I think getting back to um, standard communication of, of um, you know, even if it's if how, how emails are addressed or how people are being reached via, you know, the news, the print news um, is all very important as well. Any other questions for Nina? Okay, great. Nina, we will take um, this under advisement and um, we will be making, um, uh, discussing the appointment at the next June 15th meeting. Okay. You're welcome to stick around Thank and watch you. the meeting. Thank and you if all. not, I'll see you tomorrow night. Okay, sounds good. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we're going to start uh, our regular meeting. Before we get to public comment though, as chair of the select board, I wanna take a moment before we begin to denounce the horrific death of George Floyd, which took place in Minneapolis last week. These continued heinous and cowardly acts of police brutality have become too frequent and the use of excessive force is not only intolerable, but critically jeopardizes people's trust and faith in our justice system. Communities are understandably frightened, angry, heartbroken, exhausted, and frustrated. Prayers and condolences are not enough. Law enforcement and officials in leadership position, in addition to showing understanding and compassion, must be accountable and follow best professional practices. Nonviolent protest, one of the great rights we are afforded as Americans, must be respected. I am proud of how our community over the past few days has exercised the right to protest in a nonviolent manner. I call on all of us to exercise our rights passionately, with common sense, and with dignity. I know Chief Poulin would like to read a statement that he released earlier today on behalf of the Exeter Police Department, but I'm sure the other members of the select board may also wish to comment. And as such, I will open it up to the board for comment at this time. Appreciate the sentiment that you just expressed, Mr. Chairman. Are there any members of the board uh, who would wish to comment additionally before Chief Poulin issues a statement? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like just like to thank you also for opening the meeting with that statement. I'm just looking to see if any hands are raised. Okay. Seeing no other members of the board um, have additional comment, uh, Chief Poulin, I'll turn it over to you uh, to give uh, the statement that you issued earlier on behalf of the extra police department. Chief Poulin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the entire Exeter Police Department, we send our deepest condolences to the family and friends of George Floyd. We also want to extend our sorrow to all people of color as subject to more pain and suffering and are reliving prior negative life experiences brought about by these acts of violence. As a police chief, I outright condemn the actions of the police officers in Minneapolis. 
I have watched a tragic video as a human life is taken from us, murdered by people who violated our oaths to serve and protect. This devastates me unbelievably. In our community, the men and women of the exit police have worked hard at building trusting relationships with people of all races and ethnicities. We will continue to do so. The history of the town of Exeter is one that describes a community that is willing to stand up for what's right in unison with strength and fortitude. And I am certain that together we will watch justice prevail. In closing, I want to say again that as a community, we place a high value on the impact of peaceful protesting and for the voice of the people to be heard. The Exeter Police will always protect everyone's rights and freedoms. However, we will not tolerate those that attempt to silence, threaten, or intimidate with hatred. I invite you all to partner with us in making Exeter become an example of helping to promote the legacy of George Floyd to become one for a positive catalyst for systematic change. Thank you. Chief, thank you for your statement tonight and thank you for issuing that earlier today on behalf of the police department. Before we move on to public comment, Mr. Dean, did you have anything to add on behalf of the town? Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank those before me who spoke and, and add my input. Um, I did write up a, a, a little statement that I'll read. Um, like my fellow town officials, as, as Exeter town manager, I condemn the actions in Minneapolis regarding George Floyd and the resulting pain brought to his family. As someone with a key administrative role within a municipality, my hope is that this senseless act can be used as a catalyst ultimately for positive change. As a result of this act, we must have change. Until then, I ask that we all feel the emotions of the situation and double our efforts and commitment to make systemic changes to assist us in creating a system that is functional, accountable, and above all is just. This must happen locally and it must happen nationally for the benefit of us all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dean. We're going to move on to public comment now. Um, and Bob, I'm going to ask that you help me uh, if there are any hands raised. If there are any members of the public who wish to comment, now is your opportunity. We ask that you please state your name and your address and ask also that if you have any, if your comment uh, is applicable to anything that's on the agenda, we ask that you pause and wait and speak to it at that time. Uh, but if not, uh, we invite you uh, to comment publicly now. And I'm going to pause for a moment to see if there's anybody. If anyone's in the call wanting to say something, if you're at, in an attendee, which I see there's two attendees, you can uh, press the raise hand button. And uh, if you wish to speak to something. And if you're watching uh, the meeting at home, you can go to the minutes agendas page to find the meeting access info if you want to speak later on um, and join the, the Zoom call. Bob, I'm going to give folks just another moment. So I know this is still new to a lot of people, including me. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm going to take a moment to get a glass of water. Okay. Do you see anybody, Bob? Nope. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any hands. No, okay. I'm clo close public comment then. We do not have any formal proclamations or recognition recognitions, which is next uh, on the agenda. However, I'd like to take a moment and informally recognize a group of people that, that reside in Exeter. Um, those are our kids, our students. Uh, this Thursday marks the end of the school year. And as we all know, due to the COVID-19 virus, um, our students in Exeter were thrown a pretty hard curveball. 
And I think we need to recognize a bunch of different people, the parents that have had to homeschool or try to homeschool our children, the teachers in Exeter who not only have had to teach virtually, but also take care of their own children in some instances. Um, but I really do want to recognize all of our students from K through 12 and just recognize all of the hard work that they've done since March and the effort that they've put in to continue their education. And I'd also like to recognize all of our graduates this year and wish them all of the best in their endeavors. I wish you could have a graduation um, that is more um, typical, but um, that's not possible. I think that the last I checked, SAU 16 is still working out how they're going to do that. But congratulations to all of our graduates, and we wish you all the best. Next on the agenda is the approval of minutes from the May 18th, 2020. Nico, meeting. can I? Sorry, I feel I feel moved to say something about Pride Month. Please do. Please do. So June is Pride Month, um, which is a, a big deal in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and we celebrate all colors and our black and brown friends and allies need us. And so we say Black Lives Matter and um, and we have a lot of work to do. So I'm really honored to be part of a board that is standing um, that is in a town that, that says that. So that's just what I want to say. Thank you, Selectwoman Cowan. Moving on to the approval of the May 18th, 2020 Town of Extra Select Board Minutes. Uh, I will ask the board if anybody had any revisions or amendments to the minutes. And if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Um, I, will, I will move that. Second. Unless anybody... Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectman Brown. I, I. <laughs> Selectman, Selectwoman Roundtree Olive. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. I, I say aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. May I just interject for one second? Uh, Mr. Brown was actually absent at the last meeting. So I think you should probably abstain. Oh, uh, wait. No, Mr. Brown was at the last meeting. He was here. Yes, he was there. That was two meetings ago. Oh, I'm ago. sorry. That was two meetings ago. Sorry. Quarantine brain. Sorry. What is time? I know. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who was. Like, was I? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Clerk, I think that's a unanimous vote. Yes. Pass the minutes. And next, we have two uh, appointments to discuss, the first of which is a motion to move uh, Ann Sermon as an alternate to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, so um, Mr. Chair, sorry, was the term identified there? No. Yes. I'm, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the term is to expire April 30th, 2021. Correct. Good catch. Thank you. It's so moved. <laughs> I will amend my motion or whoever it is. Um, Slugman Brown. Aye. Slugman Roundtree Olive. Aye. Slugman Cowan. Aye. Clerk says aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous 5-0. And the next motion is to uh, move the appointment of Kristen Osterwood to an alternate position on the Conservation Commission with a term to expire April 30th, 2021. I'll move that. So moved. Second. A motion second. Further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Slugman Brown. Aye. Black woman, oh, Roundtree Olive. Aye. Black woman, Callan. Aye. Clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. That's unanimous, five zero. Okay, moving along, we get into our discussion and action items, the first of which is an update from the Parks and Recreation Department. And I see that we have both uh, Director Mr. Bison and Assistant Director Ms. Roy with us. 
So I'll turn it over to one of you. Greg, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, you all should have received a memo in your packet uh, titled Recreation 2.0. Uh, it's our plan for the summer uh, and just give you guys an update. Uh, Gilman Park, as you all know, Gilman Park has uh, had a little face clip. We're working on a uh, pavilion that is slated to be finished uh, by the end of June. Uh, there had been some slight delays. Uh, the concrete company hired did have to shut down uh, due to COVID-19. So that was a delay. Some of the boards that we received uh, were not quality material and were sent back by the contractor. And then uh, other various issues. Uh, I will be coming to the board on the 15th uh, to ask to spend a little more of the impact fees because when we did the excavation work, it was discovered that it was an old dumping ground. So we had to do a lot of excavation and uh, it cost a little bit more, uh, but we're gonna make it look great. And so that ceremony will be uh, organized in a way that we can be under 10 people or less for ribbon cutting uh, once it, it is with the members of some select board, whoever would like to join us, uh, Mr. Dean, as well as the members of uh, SALT who manage the park. So that is a exciting, uh, happening in Gilman Park. Uh, another exciting thing happening is Kids Park. Everyone knows Kids Park is taken apart except for the purple dinosaur. Purple dinosaur remained. Uh, we have good news. Themed Concept is the company that won the award. They are completing the construction of the playground in Minnesota. It will be shipped out here in one giant piece and craned in so it's not your typical playground build so look forward to that that ribbon cutting will be postponed until restrictions on playgrounds are lifted uh hopefully we'll have a better sense of that in the summertime uh updates on tennis courts as you might have known we have actually opened the tennis courts tennis court uh, they are open for singles play only we followed the recommendation not only from our national parks and recreation association but we also follow the recommendations of the USTA. We're just trying to keep people safe. And uh, that is just asking people to bring their own equipment, not shake hands, not, not, not uh, use each other's tennis balls so, and mark them. So uh, just trying to keep everyone safe. Pickleball will get there eventually, but they are in the same guidelines as USTA. So those pickleball people will need to play one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there's no way to socially distance playing pickleball uh, when you have doubles. So you're literally four feet from each other. Uh, next would be our skate park is going to be slated. It, it is temporarily open. Uh, we're going to slowly open it now. We're getting signage that will be going up that will limit no more than 10 participants on there. That's been one of our toughest parks as Chief Poulin can attest to, uh, to keep closed. Uh, thank you Public Works for trying to help with that. Uh, that is a lot, a lot of skate parks are open around the nation because they, they the surfaces get hot and uh, it's really not something that is for younger kids. So that's the one thing that we found is a common theme around the, the country. Uh, basketball court, we have not opened at the tennis courts, by the way. Uh, that is still under consideration. We don't want to open it up because we don't want basketball games uh, breaking out. For shooting-wise, it's fine, but until uh, restrictions can be lightened a little bit, we, we're, we're just not going to open them up yet. Uh, we will open them up soon, though. And then one last thing on the park side is we are going to be looking at all the parks and the rules and regulations. Uh, we've had several complaints, as you know, uh, about park issues. And we're looking to modify the park rules so that the police can better enforce them and you guys can set the ordinance. So uh, that way there's no gray area. So that's the one thing we we experienced. The good thing is people are going out and utilizing our parks. The bad thing is they're not following all the rules or guidelines and could damage property or other people using the park. So that's, that's where that is. Recreational side, 
Uh, we sent the memo late. I apologize of the Care Kids program. Uh, we just got the governor's recommendations on summer camps at 3 p.m. prior to this uh, last Friday. So we've been working diligently over the weekend. We had pretty much put this program together and I'm going to let Melissa talk a little bit about it because she's definitely spearheaded a lot of this. Uh, but we, we, we kind of anticipated a lot of the, the nuances of the regulations. So I think we've put together a solid plan and we have just recently surveyed all the camp people and put it out there through all our database, uh, sent it out approximately 5,000 emails through constant contact. And we had about 12% opening rate. So, which is great. Uh, but the numbers of coming in for responses of who's interested uh, was a little underwhelming. So that's why we're hoping to uh, stagger in the registrations. And I'll let uh, Melissa uh, touch base on all the program and cover that. Melissa? Sorry about that. Um, I apologize. Of course, the one time my dad calls me is right now. Um, it blacked us out. So morning or good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so the program that we're, we're proposing is the Care Kid program, Care Kids program, excuse me. Um, we have done a lot of fine tuning uh, going through so many different ideas. And so this is what we have. We would like to propose that the program begin July 6th and run till August 14th, which would be a six week program. We would be offering programming between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, we would be able to take a minimum of 18 kids and a maximum of 45. What will happen is once we do our first registration, we need to do it in groups of nine because of the way that the governor's recommendations have been. We can only have groups of nine children and one staff person. Um, that is all that is allowed. Uh, we can have other people at the program, which we will, to help with that, but the groups themselves need to be independent for the entire day and the entire summer. Um, and that's to protect the kids so that if one group was to have an exposure, the other groups would, wouldn't be exposed. <clears throat> we will be offering this to grades one through seven at this time. And to be honest, when we did do the survey, we had a large response. We had about eight kids um, that wanted grades six and seven. So there's definitely an interest in that. We would like to run it out of the recreation park like we talked about before. We do have to talk a little bit about um, if the park, if let's say the program only has 18 kids at the minimum, uh, are we still able to close the park down or do we block off fields one and, uh, excuse me, two and three and move the camp up there? So there does need to be a little bit of conversation about where to do that. <clears throat> we are going to be hiring between three and nine staff members, depending on how many people we get for ratios. What we'd like to do is offer the program to the people uh, that have said yes and then offer it to whoever up to 45. We do think that people at this point have either found some childcare, have decided to keep some of their kids home, um, or maybe being alternative plans. Uh, so I think we feel pretty comfortable that we'll be okay. Each day when participants join us, they will come into the parking lot. Their parent will be not allowed to leave. Uh, they will the child will have a mask. The staff will have a mask. They will get a temporal temperature check. They will answer three or four questions. If everything is okay, then they get to stay for the day. If it isn't okay and their temperature is high or there seems to be some visible illness, they have to get back in the car and go with their parents or guardian. So we have to do that every single morning. We would be staggering drop-off. So each group would have a, a drop-off and pickup time with about 10 to 15 minutes in between, depending on how we can work that. We will be following the New Hampshire Task Force guidelines for a sick child or isolating child, which also references the CDC guidelines. So we'll be following all of that. Our staff and the recommendation of the New Hampshire Governor's Task Force, the uh, day camp uh, regulations, do not ask that children wear masks. Um, the Department of he DHHS has uh, made the recommendation that they don't feel 
na- masks are necessary for the children because we will be majority of outside and also continuing to keep the six foot social distancing. When they released the guidelines, uh, the American Pediatrics Association also made the recommendation that children not wear the masks. They felt that for having to wear them for an entire day, it just would be counterproductive, whether that was staff constantly asking to put them back on or touching their face. It just wasn't going to do anything. That's what they felt. Our staff would be allowed to wear masks if they would like to, um, or they can continue to keep as long as they are comfortable and able to keep a six foot distance. They can take it off as long as they are outside. Uh, Let's see. We would be having um, hand sanitizer stations all throughout the fields up at the rec park, as well as using the bathroom for hand washing stations. We've canceled all field trips. Personal belongings will be separated. Lunch and snack will be eaten within each group. Uh, There will be no sharing of food. And then we will be cleaning Depending on how many people are registered, whether we hire a professional company, if it's only 18 kids, uh, actually Greg, myself and David have said that we would be able to clean and sanitize the bathrooms um, just because it would be such a small amount of children. Um, But if it gets much bigger than that, we'd be having a private company come in. So those are all of the guidelines that we went through and we worked really hard. We know it's not our typical summer camp program. But we do feel really strongly that we know people in Exeter need this and need to have some options available to them. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have. And one thing I did ask Greg uh, to go through and Melissa to go through Nico with the board was just kind of a status report of what they've received in terms of numbers to date (laughs) and sort of what their thought process is to make the camp viable from a numbers perspective, how many they would have to have. And that tonight, it's not really a decision point per se, but just to get some feedback from the board. And so you understand, and and we're seeing this in other, uh, you know, other entities too, in recreation and sports, there are leagues going out asking if people want to play and that sort of thing. And so the numbers are coming in kind of slowly and, uh, you know, groups are being reduced as you would expect. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, I just wanted to put that into some context for you. So you had a chance to digest it while we're having the conversation. Sure. So when we first put out our initial survey, we've done uh, three different surveys. The first initial survey, we had 38 people come back and say, we definitely wanted summer camp in any shape, any form. We we will be there if there's something offered. Um, And then the last survey that we just did, um, we have 16 children that uh, families have said would come to the Care Kids program. Um, we did the numbers today and we can take, if we can get two more kids at 18 kids, we can make the program viable. It's Mm -hmm. obviously very, very different than summer camp. Um, we would have to, in that scenario, group the children, uh, grades one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven. And actually the uh, families that have said yes at this current time, that actually works into like a group of nine and a group of eight. It actually works out perfectly. We um, we can make, after 18, we can go in stages of nine. So we can make the program viable at 18, and then if we get nine on the wait list, we can make another group. We get nine more, we can make another group up to 45. We do need the nine kids to be able to support the staff salary and any increases in, in cleaning supplies or equipment. Um, so that's how we would do that. We would start with our initial 18 and then work our way up each time we'd get a wait list. And we would explain that to people when we talked to them, if they called and got on a wait list, we could say, you know, we need nine, your number, blah, 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 out of nine. Uh, once we get to nine, we can hire another staff person and make the next group. Okay. So I understand my recollection from the last meeting was that you could, the maximum number of kids you could have uh, under this, um, the care kids was 50, correct? It was. And then the governor released his guidelines of said that instead of what we were expecting to be either a 10 or a 12 to one, it was nine to one. So, so we're going to bring 45. that. Yeah. We're going to, we have to bring okay. that down to 45. Yeah. Okay. So until you get a group of nine, so for instance, 18 is your minimum. You can't make it work for under 18. So if you get the two additional kids and you have two groups of nine and you have, you know, four or five other families that are in need, 
they're waitlisted until you can get four more kids to make a group of nine. I get that to make it work. Um, I think part of the board, and I'd like the rest of the board to weigh in too. I think part of our concern when we canceled, um, made the heartbreaking decision to cancel summer camp was that for families that had essential needs, we wanted to have something to offer. Um, and it would just be painful for me if there were five or six families that had that need and nowhere to go. And we couldn't offer anything because of the, the group of nine. So is there One any the, wiggle room or? Uh, honestly, Nico, maybe like six. Um, I'd have to do the exact numbers. You know, we may be able to take a group of six just to cover the staff salary. But okay. one of the things we were talking about was our summer prog- programs are always only Exeter only. And we take a lot of pride and that's a really amazing um, benefit of living in Exeter. And so what we were thinking was if we opened up the registration to Exeter residents, gave them a, a significant, you know, a designated amount of time. And then we wanted to know if the board would consider letting us open it up to the SAU 16 children so that the families in Exeter could get their needs met, even if we had to backfill two or three spots in a group, like you said, say there were four Exeter residents mm-hmm. and then we got four from one of the SAU Um We weren't sure how you guys would feel about that. Obviously, this would be just this summer and just this program. Uh, We would keep our normal summer camp in the in the way that we always do. But uh, we were wondering if that would be a consideration so that we could help the families next year if we needed a few more people. I think that's a great solution, personally. One, one more question, Melissa, if I may. So the, it's June 1st. Uh, when would the cutoff or what is the cutoff? And if it doesn't exist, when do you anticipate it would be for Exeter residents to decide? Because I'm sure some people are doing their due diligence and seeing what's available for how length, how length of time. You know, you said this one is going to be for a finite period. Folks may need something more, but ultimately may have to come back to us. Right. So when when is the deadline or what do you anticipate the deadline being for Exeter folks to respond to this? So, it, you know, we didn't really talk about a deadline because we wanted to bring it up to you, but we would like to give them at least a week. You know, one of our biggest issues that we have and when we and we wanted to explain this tonight was we don't want to hold up the parents that really need care right. um, a second time. Right. right. So we need mm-hmm. to kind of. We need to go, <laughs> but we want we wanted to talk with you um, and sure. make sure everything was okay. Um, that we were all on the same page and felt comfortable with what we were proposing. But I, we are literally talking about trying to get registration started Wednesday, um, mm-hmm. as long as everybody is in agreement. Um, and if we have sixteen people say yes in the last four days, so we know those are pretty 16 very recent we would just need two more and then we can try to say can you talk to a friend you know we can maybe try to find some families to help like you said if there's four and try to get them to nine um we're going to do it the very best we can because we know how important it is yeah and you bring up a legitimate concern and i tend to agree with selectman brown that um if that's what it takes to make this work then opening it up to other sau towns other SAU families make sense. Um, obviously, I want to you know take care of the folks in Exeter that have that need first. Um, do you have commitment from staff? I mean, if you, in the best case scenario, you have 45 kids, five groups of nine, do you have commitment from staff at this point? So we do. And this is one of the tricky parts that we have. Um, once we do registration this week, we should be able to see if we hit our minimum, which we're pretty sure we're going to hit the 18. We definitely have staff for that. What gets tricky is we are going to have to tell some of the other staff that if we don't hit 45, we may not be able to. We have to kind of work on that. So we may um, have contingents uh, where we say, you know, we may come back to you in a week. Please, you know, I think we have enough staff through our camp roster that we would be able to find people and be able to train them and make sure that it was all appropriate and it was appropriate staff working. Um, I just can't guarantee that it was going to be the nine that we were originally hoping to have with 45 kids and maybe a different group. Thoughts from members of the board.
I just think a lot of this might just be preemptive. I mean, I think once you open up the registration, hopefully we'll we'll have a lot of people sign up pretty quickly um, because I know that there was a lot of feedback from folks that they were disappointed that camp was going to be canceled. So I think um, best case, I'm thinking best case scenario that we will be able to fill with Exeter residents pretty quickly once you open up registration. Mm-hmm. Um, if not, then I, I gather you guys will come up with a great plan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. But we hope so, too. Uh, you know, it's just all depends on how people feel. And and uh, and hopefully they feel that we have. I, I have to tell you, Greg, David and I all weekend, all night, you know, we're on national calls trying to get the best and, and most accurate information to, to provide this program as safely as we can, because this is a whole new ball game. <laughs> Selectwoman Gilman, you have your hand up. Yes, I would like to say thank you for your diligence following all these guidelines and getting new ones uh, every day even (laughs) are hard to keep up with, and I appreciate the due diligence that you're doing. Um, I also think like uh, to follow up on uh, Selectwoman Roundtree-Olaf's points that this may be like the hairdressers and, and outside dining where if people are eager to do it, but they want to see other people do it first. Um, so, you know, things are going to follow. <laughs> I hope so. That would be wonderful. And thank you so much. I, the entire department, all four of us have been on daily calls and working really hard. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. And, and really, we would have wanted to open it up earlier if we had had the recommendations earlier. Just getting him on Friday and Eric and James have been outstanding. I know I see the chiefs on here. Uh, They've gotten us some masks and some thermometers already. And we're working on uh, other uh, Phillips Exeter Academy donated some, uh, some masks to us as well. Cloth masks we can use for our staff. So, I mean, this is a community effort to get this off the ground and working. So it's a kudos to the staff that we work with. What, what are the time frames you're suggesting then for um, us to make a decision if you you want to give up to a certain date for Exeter families and then expand it out to SAU 16 families? Are you hoping to get a decision tonight or what, what dates are you I- looking for? I guess I don't know that I'm, we need permission for dates, and that's fine if you'd like to do that. I think what we're looking for is um, feedback or approval to go ahead and, and run the program now that we've got the governor's um, uh, recommendations and we have the, the program finalized. You know, we would like to give Exeter residents a week or two uh, pre- priority, and we'll just you may see Park and Rec all over Facebook, all over email, you know, or, you know, posters around town um, trying to get the word out. But uh, we'd like to give we'd like to give Exeter residents. But I don't if you'd like to give us a date, that's fine. I think for us, we we just wanted approval that it was OK to go forward with the program and start taking registrations. And I think you know, my, my personal opinion would be to defer to you as to when you think a reasonable time would be to expand it after you've given Exeter residents an opportunity to respond to your survey. Okay. Um, but certainly, you know, I'd like to hear if anybody else on the board has any thoughts or differences of opinion there. Okay. I know my date was June 19th is what I had in mind for like a last day for Exeter residents to register and to check the numbers as of Friday, June 19th. And in the meantime, what we could do is also um, allow for SAU 16 families to put their kids on a list sure. and sort of hold, and sort of hold those and then see where we're at on the 19th and see if it meets the 45 or we're still short or you know obviously if we have more than that we're going to whittle down the SAU 16 list a little bit if that makes up some of it or if it's all Exeter at that point you know good successful uh, registration that is completely fine with me, Greg. Does that work for you? Yeah, no, that's uh, Russ and I had talked about that earlier. And yeah, especially we could come back to the board on the 15th, giving you an update of, all right, we have X amount of Exeter residents signed up the deadline. And just to remind people is the 19th, trying to urge more people to sign up and then open it up to anyone else that needs childcare. Sounds great. 
Okay. And I, cause I share your concern, um, Melissa, I'd hate to have, you know, an extra family be on hold for several weeks when they could be finding something else and then, you know, get stuck at the last minute. Um, Mr. Dean, do we need to make a motion to authorize the Parks and Rec de uh, Department to initiate the Care Kids program for the year 2020? I think that would be great to have that as an emotion. Mr. Chair, before we go on, go on to a motion, uh, I'd like to ask a question which may have already been asked and I just oh, didn't um, Is there a consideration for opening serially when you get your first group, go ahead and start them off and then wait till you get a, another group to get another employee to start them off instead of waiting till one day and open the whole thing up? So we could absolutely think of that, obviously, as the governor put out their recommendation. Um, I think it was the June 29th that we couldn't have anything open to. So by June, uh, July 6th, we have, you know, five kids on the wait list. And then suddenly we have two more families in a week um, and we're able to get staff. It would all just depend on if we were able to get the appropriate staff and get them trained then, you know, if we can make it work, I think <laughs> if there's anything David, Greg, and I have learned about this entire situation, it's think of any idea possible and then how can you make it work? So if we can make it work, we will do the very best that we can to get as many kids in the program safely. And technically in June 22nd, we're actually talking about COVID training. We have an excellent expert online training module uh, to talk about how to deal with COVID-19. I uh, would work with Eric and James as well to come in talking about proper hygiene and uh, just trying to think of everything that we can to give the staff all the, all the tools to be successful. And some of the other things that we are making a priority this summer, which are a priority every summer, but especially this summer is how to work with the kids when they first get there. They've been at home for how many months under either some have been very, had very strict rules or no rules at all. And just, and being aware and kind and welcoming that uh, the behaviors may be awful or wonderful, a mix of everything, you know, every child is going to have handled the last few months differently. And so trying to give our staff some tools to, prepare for that and um, and to be able to help the kids get reacclimated into a, a daily schedule and be with their friends and all, and all that stuff. So we're making that a priority as well during training. Selectman Gilman, did you have another question? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Selectman Brown? If I just had a process question, um, I definitely appreciate the level of granularity and, um, and thoroughness that um, the committee, the we've gotten from Parks and Rec. I'm just wondering if structurally, is there a better way for this to um, go in the future? So it feels like, I understand that we have budgetary oversight here, but um, we're making decisions that it feels a little bit out of our purview. For example, some of the child issues that we're talking about here, it feels, I'm not sure where this would be, but again, I, I appreciate um, the level of creative thinking that's gone on to figure out ways to fill this up. But as we talk about kids with uh, various needs, families with various needs. It feels like there might be some layer that we can empower that would make more, um, just more holistic decisions. Because regardless of whether it's a yes or no, at this level, it just genuinely feels like the, uh, there's details that we're, um, you know, that we're just not aware of as, as we operate uh, across a bunch of different concerns, if that makes any sense. No. So, like, Moon Brown, if you can hear me, you you froze about 30 seconds ago. Okay. So, sorry. So, it's just a general process question about um, is this the right place to be uh, making decisions about families uh, with economic needs, behavior, all different spectrum of educational needs, um, for the child care needs for the summer. I'm not sure. And I just have a general open question of um, – should we revisit this decision-making structure so that the select board isn't the one um, uh, where these can, anyway, I, I'm not sure if we're the best place for this to stop. No, and that's, and that's a good question. And I think, you know, typically we wouldn't be getting involved. I think in this scenario, 
we had to make a decision to cancel summer camp. And, you know, historically, annually, summer camp is run by the, uh, by the rec department and it doesn't come before the select board. I think that what makes this a little more unorthodox this year uh, is given the circumstances, we had to, number one, make the decision to cancel summer camp and then create an option by which, hopefully for just 2020, that those families with essential jobs that need daycare uh, have an opportunity. And I, so I think the whole process question is, is that we're doing something that's, that's sort of out of the norm and we're creating a different program, ho- again, hopefully for, for 2020. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the reminder of all that. So then uh, with that said, I would ask, have we involved the social worker or someone in... Um, Someone at a deeper level, because we've spent about two or three months with um, families in crisis, closed, shut away. And so now we're moving on economic grounds, but um, we basically don't know what we are turning our back to right now uh, based on the past few months. So I just would feel more comfortable if we um, had another layer of, um, I guess, not even inclusion, just awareness here. It feels like our yeses and nos are based on very, they're based on things, as you already said, that are from the norm time. And we're outside the norm time and we have a lot of uh, mystery things growing in our town that I, you know, the things we're not thinking of. How do we, how do we um, ask the right questions right now? So. Uh, well, we actually do have a very good relationship. Uh, her, her last name escapes me, Christine. She's Clifford. the guidance counselor. Clifford. Well, um, Clifford, thank you. Uh, and she was willing to help us with staff training so we can better suit ourselves to deal with this. And uh, we would definitely be reaching out uh, tonight if, if you guys give the green light on this. Okay. All right. Select woman Roundtree Olaf. Yes, I just want to follow up to both what Daryl and Greg said. And um, I'm very happy to hear that you're talking with Christine Clifford. Um, She's great and works well with the students. My biggest concern is because I know that we are limited to keeping the nine students together for the entire summer, that if there are social, emotional issues that do come about, we then will have to make the decision who gets to stay and who gets to go within a group. So... I don't know what the plan of action is if there are issues like that that do come up um, over the course of the summer, but perhaps having someone like Christine as a consultant or, um, you know, someone of that nature who can kind of help staff on an ongoing basis when we run into those issues, because those issues will come up. Like, like you've all said, these kids have been isolated for a very long time and I I've interacted with adults and some of them have left their social graces. So I can only imagine what is going to happen when kids reemerge together after having not been, you know, on a daily basis, socializing together. So it's just something to consider. I think you guys have done a great job thus far creating the um, best thing that we can have available to families. Um, But if, if that's something that the budget can handle, or if that's something that, you need, I would absolutely be in favor of it and, and hope that we can find a way to do that. So just to, and just to reinforce the points that are made, because I think they're really good ones, is what we're well into now is that this is a, a completely abnormal year now. And like Ms., uh, Mr. Chairman said, and Daryl said, and, and I think you alluded to Lovey, Camp usually runs uh, autopilot. You know, th- we've got it all laid out and we're collectively dealing with these issues right now in a lot of ways just because of the guidelines and because we don't have all of our traditional programs, which are normally well underway and not even something a board needs to think about. So it's almost an apology for having to bring these things through you, but at the same time, it's important to have your input and sign off on these things as well, just to make sure that you're supportive of the concepts and the programs that we're, we're doing because we are going sort of outside the norm of where we are. So I really appreciate your comments and, and the concerns because I think those are good ones. This is uncharted territory. I know it's cliche at this point, but it still is. And trying to maneuver within these guidelines is sometimes pretty tricky. Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? Uh, Chair, Chairperson, yes. sorry, excuse me. Um, this isn't about this program this summer. I did want to say that as a rec department, we, we chatted and we said that we would come back to you and give you an answer about registration for next year. This will take just one second. Yeah. Uh, what we would like to propose is anybody that is an Exeter resident that had a slot in camp this year before it was canceled, if they fill out the paperwork by the deadline, which we'll, you know, get to in October, like we did, would be guaranteed a spot for the following summer because we want to say thank you for everybody and for registering and and being so gracious with the fact that we had to cancel. So we would like to make sure that everybody that had a spot this year that wants it next year can get it. That is a wonderful idea. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Um, I really am. I, I think that's that is a, a great idea. And I think that will take a lot of stress off of parents wondering about next year. Um, and may I just suggest and remind that not everybody's on Facebook or social yeah. media. And I know that email addresses and IT departments and the whole thing. I just ask that you please take your time in ensuring that everybody is getting the email um, in a timely fashion so that they can fill out the paperwork in time. Maybe because we have enough time, maybe this is something where we actually mail the form to every camp family so they physically get it to their home. We'll, we'll do multiple things to make sure everybody gets the information. We've got a, a few months to plan, so you know it, it, should, it should go seamlessly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, okay. And then I'd like to entertain a motion to authorize the Parks and Rec Department um, to go ahead with creating the Care Kids program with up to 45 kids, a minimum of 18 kids for the year of 2020. Second. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectman Brown. Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. Clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. This is unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but wait, there's more, as they say, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> there, there, is, there is definitely more, which actually piggybacks on the summer or the Care Kids program. Uh, Russ and I had a very positive Zoom meeting with Dr. David Ryan last week talking about how we can start opening up the community for these youth activities because that's one of the things is the mental health, to Lovey's point of these kids, is getting to feel new normal, to feel them a little more comfortable going out. Uh, and they were gracious enough. They've opened up pretty much their facilities to us uh, and – to a point to kind of use it as a testing ground for this fall. So uh, we have, we'll have access working with Rusty Lister, their new uh, head of facilities and, and Dr. Ryan in creating more programs or using Lincoln Street School as a site for our rain sites for the uh, Care Kids program, which is outstanding. Uh, we are, we did approach him if you saw in the, the memo that was late, uh, as possibly if that's an option of having it at Lincoln street, uh, permanently for the whole summer, but either or either way will work fine. But that also opened up a slew of other opportunities, the drive-in movies and concerts that we've talked about. Uh, we actually did a site walk on Friday of last week on the grounds of Exeter high school. And it's perfectly situated to have plenty of social distancing as well as uh, have an opportunity for people to feel a little bit normal. Uh, the first one was the movies. We were really thinking hard of how we can get nostalgic <laughs> and get people feeling like they can go out to the movies. Yes, it will be a movie they've probably seen or wanted to see. Uh, it won't be a new release because we can't get those. But at the same time, we uh, feel confident that the sophomore parking lot, and if anyone's familiar with the high school, that's the parking lot adjacent to the stadium, uh, would be our backdrop for our drive-in. 
that would working with Bob and Exeter TV, uh, we got a transmitter so people don't need to leave their cars. They can listen to the movie right in there. We can actually give announcements over the radio as well, which is outstanding. We would charge approximately $15 a car, which is a great deal, but also give the opportunity where if they wanted to, we would work with area businesses and restaurants that uh, would serve food where they could have a, a package like, for instance, pizza. So one of the establishments could be that pizza night. And so along with the movie and the entrance in to watch the movie, families could sign up to have a pizza delivered to their car while they watch it. Granted it's after, <laughs> after dinner, but who knows people may want something, uh, a late night snack. So uh, we're proposing uh, in the memo, it says uh, the 12th, Dr. Ryan and Rusty Lister asked if we could do it after that. Uh, so it would be the following week, but it also would give us way to engage with the public. We want to make sure it's as exciting for them as possible and offer them movies that they would love to see or come out to see. Uh, I'm going to throw kudos to my wife who is now walking around the house around here somewhere, but she's like, go with the eighties nostalgia where you do these eighties movies like ghostbusters. <laughs> or some funding, something fun like that. But we, we, we definitely have one in mind. We have a license last uh, that's from last year, National Treasure. We'd show around the 4th of July. We would actually uh, buy another screen and not the inflatable one. Or, uh, it's great for in person, but we're talking about hanging a screen off of the back of the stadium. So... Uh, for a few hundred dollars, uh, we could definitely get a screen and we have a projector. So we feel confident that that would be a successful thing. Uh, movie restaurants are now doing it to drive people in. The Galley Hatch just did it. Uh, and I think this would be a big hit for the people of Exeter. And then on that would be on a Friday night. So starting on Friday nights. So we know people need to work still. <laughs> and so that would allow them to stay up a little late, come to drive in movie with us and uh, the parks and rec will be there to treat them well. And then also that opens up the possibility of doing drive in concerts to below music hall in Derry, uh, which brings in phenomenal bands actually wanted to bring more joy and music back to people. So they actually set up a drive in concert, which has been very successful. It was actually an article about them in the Washington post uh, last week about it and i think this is a, an opportunity where we do have great local bands uh that we could tap into we had a, a great lineup but at the same time we had a lot of them traveling so to limit the travel and the exposure we would cancel what is officially on swayze parkway and uh open it up to uh area bands to quickly work with us uh and team and other various artists around town that would be willing to help with us. The limitation I heard is they like to have trios. So it can't be a full rock band, but that may loosen up. Uh, originally for those that know, didn't know restaurants are started out allowing solo artists and now it's gone up to trios. So maybe <laughs> by next week, maybe it's up to five as long as they can social distance. So uh, our hopes is this would be an opportunity where, different genres of music would be able to every week and it, it'd be a free concert. Uh, we would use the faculty parking lot uh, at the high school in the back as well. Cause it's, it's sheltered back there. It's long enough where if we center a stage, we're hoping to get a flatbed trailer <laughs> that can go there that bands could set up on. And uh, we would run it in the same model as the drive-ins. Every other spot, you've got to stay in your car. As things loosen, maybe then they can maybe take a chair and sit in front of their car. Uh, just trying to make people feel normal. And I think that's something that we could easily do. So Parks and Rec would again be there to provide entertainment in this bleak time. <laughs> I think you're going to get, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to get uh, inundated with movie suggestions and uh, musicians. <laughs> Julie, I will take that uh, <laughs> because, again, we, we are here for the people and the residents and uh, we, we like to make sh bring the community together. And I think that in this time we need these type of events that as long as we can social distance properly, 
we can uh, provide joy to them. And thank you. Greg and Melissa, I love both ideas. And, um, you know, I'm thinking of at least 10 iconic bands that were trios, Greg, so I think you'll be okay. Um, but what about... Um, and I, I, again, I, I, I echo what Select Woman Gilman said about the movie selections, but more, I'm more concerned with the concerts, uh, discouraging, you know, or, or not discouraging, but um, how are we going to prevent, you know, dancing or anything like that where you may be tempted to not social distance? We, we, would, we would lay it out uh, that they need to remain in their cars. And that's something that, unfortunately, Melissa, myself, and David will be the fun police <laughs> and ask people either to get back in their car or please leave. Uh, we don't want it to cause a riot or anything. And the, the point is, if we have to, I think Chief Poulin would send a, a, an officer up. Uh, but we, we want people just to be able to get out of their house. I, I've known a lot of friends that actually will just go on drives now for two to three hours around the state of New Hampshire because they, yeah. they need to get out of their four walls. So uh, I think the residents of Exeter will be respectful in keeping to that. Now, granted, if it's a great band, every, <laughs> everyone will want to get up and dance, but uh, we're asking that they, they respect others. And to follow that, as Greg said, uh, we hope that throughout the summer, we may see the guidelines eased where, you know, maybe the first few weeks, uh, yes, these are the restrictions that we have. But as people get in the swing of things and, and, and things change, we're hoping by moving it from Swayze over to their uh, parking lot, it gives us the ability to stay in one location and involve as the guidelines evolve. So if dancing is allowed by the end of the summer, we'll all be dancing. And if beach chairs are, are allowed, but it's a great place for us to be able to evolve throughout the entire summer. Great. Any other comments from the board? Looking for hands. Okay. Both ideas sound great. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the work that you've put into this and obviously the cooperation from SAU 16 um, without whom you may not have been able to pull this off. So, Yes, but the one thing, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this con summer concerts were slated as one of those proposed delays in spending. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would like to have authorization to expend the $8,000 if possible. And I don't think you need to make a motion on that. It's just just an acknowledgement that we would take that off yeah. the list of productions and look I mean, elsewhere to make that to, up. To me, that's something that you'd work out internally with your budget. You know what you have, you know, with the request of Mr. Dean has been to look at your budget. So um, yeah. unless there are members of the board that disagree, I think that's something you can work out. Oh, 100%. Yes, thank you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. And lastly, uh, seeing that we're on the topic of COVID-19, I've been working with Russ and some area rec directors uh, to develop not only a waiver uh, that we will have any participants use when they're using our, uh, our facilities uh, that acknowledges COVID-19 and everything. Uh, we've ran it by Primex as well as uh, the Mitchell Group. And both, for what it's worth said, the waiver is good, but it's a waiver in this piece of paper. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a step in the right direction that we acknowledge. And as well as the athletic permitting, as you know, youth sports is trying to make a comeback with baseball and softball. Yes. Uh, those are two sports that use our facilities. Uh, we've developed a whole guideline that the, the league needs to, to agree that they're going to follow the, the state guidelines. Because if you read the youth sports guidelines, they're very specific, uh, not sharing equipment except for like baseballs and softballs and socially distancing and how you do things like that. So I've actually ran it by all leagues that use our facilities currently. That would be Exeter Junior Baseball and the Exeter Junior Softball, as well as uh, Exeter Youth Soccer. And all of them are 
thumbs up. That's what exactly they've all been talking about all these measures in their board meetings anyways. So as we open up and I know tentatively the plan for softball, they would love to uh, get on the field uh, towards the end of June with some possible games in July. If phase two is opened up, we will, we don't know that until the governor does as uh, well as baseball. And of course, soccer is just holding still because that's one that the task forces had a hard time really examining. The, if you watch and listen to the task force on youth sports, they acknowledge that every youth sport is vastly different depending on what kind of contact. And baseball, softball were the easiest one because there's not a lot of physical contact in those sports sports unless you have a collision at home plate which i don't think any of these kids are running down in the catcher uh but softball or soccer and flag football and tackle football lacrosse field hockey they all have physical contact with them so that's something they're examining and trying to figure out but uh first up is baseball softball so we're happy to to run anything by you but i think the 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 permit's there and it's ready to go very good. Any other questions or comments for Greg and Melissa? Terrific. Thank you both. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you. Have a nice night. You too. Thank you. Okay, next on our action items, we have um, two bond documents, um, the library and also the groundwater surface water assessment um, Mr. Dean, before we read these, um, I had a question on the library bond. Um, where, where they've been working without anybody at the library since it closed in March. Um, you know, my, my, my inquiry is, might they complete the project sooner than expected? And if so, would that save any money on the total project? So I think that's an unknown at this point. Um, I did have a conversation with Doug Eastman, our building inspector today, to talk mm -hmm. to him about sort of what he's seen on the site. And I've actually gone over and toured the site myself. And the feedback that he got from Bowen was consistent with what I've what I got, which is by this time next year, they anticipate they'll probably still be on site. They mm -hmm. may be substantially complete a month or so earlier than that, but that you know, they've run into a couple of situations, sort of subterranean issues uh, within the foundation of the building that they'd, they've had to address, some sewer uh, issues, drainage issues. The penstock has made it a little tricky. I know that they had, they had some issues with the uh, original plans not matching what was actually in the ground over there, which sometimes happens when you go back to the 80s to try to deal with a project like this. Um, so the long and short of it is we don't know yet. There's an owner contingency in the soft costs of about $83,000. And then in the hard costs, there's a construction contingency of one seventy four seven hundred. dollars So I think we'll have to get an update from Hope and the library uh, board uh, pretty soon to tell us sort of what, how the calendar is working. But that was the latest feedback that we got. Okay, thank you. Um and I think it might also be prudent in one of our meetings uh, in the next few weeks to maybe have Hope and a member of the trustees uh, join us to talk about the project and maybe also where their budget is, where I know every other department is sort of trying to uh, cut a few things. Right. Uh, would that be possible to do that? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think we can get uh, Hope on and have uh, have a conversation about the project progress and any budgetary questions you want to ask. But I did I did include her in the list of things um, to produce documentation for uh, reduction. So she's aware of that as well. And I think they're saving money on part time employees right now, not having them working. And uh, so therefore, you know, there's opportunities for some savings out of the, that budget. Understood. Hi, Doreen. Hi, good evening, everyone, Mr. Chair. Um, I have spoken to Hope, um, both items on the construction. One of the other items is um, materials. They're having a lot of delays in materials because of COVID-19. Okay. 
So that's kind of slowed them down a bit. And plus the other items that Mr. Dean mentioned. And um, I have spoken to Hope about part-time wages since, you know, there, there are savings, they're not paying any right now that mm -hmm. she would speak to the trustees and that that would be a give back item this year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments before we get into the reading? Madam Clerk? Okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Dean, I have to read everything in here. <laughs> On the certificate of vote uh, regarding authorization of the bonds, yes. the answer is yes. It is actually, uh, it's about two pages long, yeah. All right. Um, I believe this is the first time I've ever seen the word clerk in there. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, certificate of, uh, of vote regarding authorization of bonds and approval of loan agreement with the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank. I, the undersigned clerk of the issuer, hereby certify that at a meeting of the governing body of issuers, the board, was held on June 1st, 2020. A quorum of the board was in attendance and voting throughout. I further certify that there are no vacancies on the board, that all, all of the members of the board were duly notified of the time, place, and purpose of said meeting, including as one of the purposes, the, the authorization of bonds and the approval of a loan agreement between the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank or Bond Bank and the issuer. I further certify that the following is a true copy of resolutions unanimously adopted at the said meeting. Resolved that under the pursuant, under and pursuant to the Municipal Finance Act, Chapter 33, New Hampshire RSA, as amended, the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank Law, Chapter 35-A, NHRS, uh, New Hampshire RSA, as amended, and other laws in addition thereto, and to votes of the issuer duly adopted on March 13th, 2018, and March 12th, 2019, under Articles 7 and 6, respectfully, respectively, <laughs> uh, of the warrants for such annual meetings of the issuer. There be and hereby is authorized, authorized the issuance of a $5,105,885 bond of the issuer, the bond, which is being issued by the issuer for the purposes of one, financing the further development of groundwater sources and the conducting of an updated view of the surface water system. And two, currently refund, refunding the issuer's $2,500,000 bond and anticipation note dated July 10th, 2019, as amended, amended on December 5th, 2019, which note was issued to finance the design and construction of renovations and repairs, including furniture, fixtures, replacement of the HVAC system, and equipment of the Exeter Public Library, the library project. And three, financing the new money costs of the library project. The bond shall be dated as of its date of issuance, shall be in such numbers and denominations as the purchaser shall request, shall mature in accordance with the schedule set forth in Exhibit A to a certain loan agreement here and after described the loan agreement, shall bear a, set in, a, set, a net interest cost rate as defined in the loan, loan agreement of 2.5% per annum or less, <laughs> lesser amount as may be determined by a majority of the board. The bond shall be substantially informed, set forth in Exhibit B to the loan agreement and otherwise shall be issued in such manner and form as the signatory shall approve by their executive, their, their execution thereof. Resolved that the bond shall be sold to the bond bank at the par value thereof plus any applicable premium. Resolved that in order to evidence the sale of the bond, the treasurer of issuer and a member of the board are authorized and directed to execute attest and deliver in the name and on behalf of the issuer, a loan agreement in substantially the form submitted to this meeting, which is hereby approved with such changes therein, not inconsistent with this vote and approved by the officers executing the same on behalf of the issuer. The approval of such changes by said officer shall be con conclusively evidenced by the execution of the loan agreement by such officers. Resolved that all things heretofore done and all actions heretofore taken 
by the issuer and its officers and agents <coughs> in its authorization of the project to be financed by the bond and hereby ratified, approved, and confirmed. Resolved that the clerk and the signers of the bond are each hereby authorized to take any and all action necessary and convenient to carry out the provisions of this vote, including delivering the bond against payment, therefore. Resolved that the useful life of the project being financed is in excess of 20 years. I further certify that said meeting was open to the public, that aforesaid vote was not taken by secret ballot nor an executive session, that the votes were taken by roll call in the meeting was held remotely and virtually and in accordance with governor's order number 12. The notice of the time and place of said meeting was posted in at least two appropriate pl public places within the territorial limits of the issuer or published in the newspaper of general circulation in said area, at least 24 hours, excluding Sundays and legal holidays before said meeting that no deliberations or actions with respect to the vote were taken in executive session and that the minutes of said meeting have been promptly recorded and have been or will be made open to inspection with 144 hours of said meeting, all in accordance with chapter 91-A NHRSA as amended. I further certify that the above vote has not been amended or rescinded and remains in full force and effective as of this date. Witness my hand and seal of the issuer, first day of June, 2020. Julie D. Gilman, second. Thank you. So you just move that and second that and then vote it as approved. All right, I'll move that. I'll second, second that. <laughs> <laughs> Motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectman Brown. Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. The clerk says aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. It's unanimous. Yes, indeedy. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of quick notes on this. The uh, the bond for the especially for the new members, we're looking at a 15 year bond for the library, uh, and the interest rate they put at 2.5 percent. They put in as a hedge, so it won't be more than two and a half percent. So it gives us something to actually look at. But the actual interest rate will be determined at a later date. And uh, the groundwater surface assess uh, water assessment, since it's similar to an engineering design. Uh, issue will be a five-year uh, window of amortization compared to the 15 for the library. Okay. Mr. Dean, is there anything to be read for the groundwater surface water? No, those are um, both of the, the, the bonds, uh, the, the numbers are incorporated into that one reading. The total amount that we're borrowing is uh, in the loan agreement, and it is yep. five million. Bold. Five million. Right, so it'd be yeah, five million one hundred five thousand five hundred five, I believe. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk, for the read. Looking happy to sign. <laughs> Uh, next on our discussion action items uh, are standard COVID-19 update. I know we have um, various town staff here to give an update. Um, Chief Wilking, why don't we start with you? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, uh, good evening. Select Boy and all. Um, it's hard to believe it's been three months to the, almost to the day that New Hampshire starts first positive case in the Lebanon area and I guess this is the new norm, um, Russ and all, and, and I've been tracking it. And uh, just a couple of uh, new, newsy notes, I guess, are worth mentioning that in the past six weeks since the state has ramped up their testing, we saw a lot of positives uh, kind of gain in strength. Uh, the Rockingham County's average, for instance, was, was 25 to 27 every day. Uh, and in the past um, two select board meetings, two-week periods, 
we've dropped uh, six, uh, 18 per day, and now we're down to 14 per day. So although the state numbers don't seem to be reflecting any kind of reduction, they've kind of plateaued, uh, Rockingham County certainly has, uh, and Exeter has seen four additional cases in the past two weeks, bringing our total to 21, sadly, but uh, we've had quite a run there without any. So, uh, so 200 on the past two weeks in Rock County and four in Exeter. So we're still doing well for communities our size, but vigilance and, and following the governor's orders and wearing a mask when possible is all key to, to keeping a handle on this. Um, the fire department is back to full strength. Uh, the Massachusetts National Guard released our member from uh, from active duty. Uh, you returned to, to the station today. Uh, so that commitment is done. Uh, James has not been going out to the farmer's market every Thursday as we did for the first few. Uh, it seemingly is running as well as can be expected at the SST property. Uh, there's been no uh, no reports to my office as the EMD or, or uh, or James Health with concerns for the farmers' markets. We wish them all the best of luck. And we'll continue to check in periodically. But right now, I guess uh, I report things are okay. Um, James and I have been working with uh, with Darren and all the town staff, the town manager, on uh, assisting any restaurant in town uh, to opening on the street and doing outside dining. And I think the process that Darren created has been working very, very well. Uh, I, I know I have the ability to review them all, sign off on them, and get follows the there. So uh, I have for that. I, I hope the restaurants will see relief and I see a positive spin on that. So I think it, it's very good. Um, from, a, from an emergency manager standpoint, my position is the interim uh, EMD for town. Uh, I submitted a request to FEMA for all of our costs to date. Their window started on January 20, but since really COVID didn't kind of pop in, until well into February and certainly from Hampshire into March, our costs early on were very, very negligible. But uh, with Doreen's help, we were able to identify uh, items that would likely be approved by FEMA. And then we set aside other items that we would like to uh, submit to, uh, through the GOFA program and, uh, and the municipal relief for COVID. So I submitted $22,000 worth of uh, uh, invoices uh, over time for fire police and other town uh, employees uh, and uh, are looking probably... Uh, I, I like to jokingly say FEMA uses a subtraction machine, not an adding machine. So uh, there will be some things to scrutinize, but I but I think we can pretty well be short of a reimbursement check in the area of seventeen five seventeen. No, nothing to write home about, but it does. But it does return a lot of the funds, uh, and because we were able to bill for equipment usage such as the ambulance for transporting patients with flu-like symptoms of COVID. Um, the 17.5 will very closely be 100% replacement of our overtime benefits and and, uh, and uh, uh, supply costs, even though they, they only <laughs> reimburse us 75 cents on the <laughs> So we've always done pretty well. Um, throughout the week last week, Doreen and I and Russ uh, worked hard to put the rest of the package together, and I'm not sure if, if Russ is going to comment more on, the, on that whole process. Uh, I certainly don't want to to rain on, on somebody else's report if they're going to do it, but uh, we were able to to pull together uh, invoices, receipts, and payroll well in excess of the grant award of three sixty two five hundred. So reasonably confident uh, as that was processed on Friday that uh, after scrutiny and their grants office review, uh, again reasonably confident the town will receive the entire. Three hundred and sixty-two thousand five to help uh, defray, you know, any anticipated revenue losses throughout the town this year. Uh, lastly, just a quick reminder: uh, the governor, as uh, Greg Bison mentioned, we got on Friday extended his stay, in, uh, stay at home order till at least June fifteen. It'll be reevaluated. Uh, highly recommend to run a mask when in public. Ten foot social distancing. It can't uh, be understated the importance of that in order to keep our numbers as low as humanly possible. So uh, I'll stay on the line and answer any questions you may have. I guess the only thing I missed was PPE. It usually comes up. Uh, we did burn through a significant amount of masks and, uh, and gowns over the last two week period. We placed an order on Friday and we were able to pick it up at the uh, Epping 
DMV office today. So we've replaced all of the masks and gowns we used over the past two to three week period. So uh, as Greg mentioned, for the parks, right, we've been successful uh, in uh, acquiring some PPE for programs like the rec and, and whatnot, but for most, but for fire EMS and PD, uh, public safety, they've been able to replace one for one all of our needs. And that's been at a no cost of the town. There's no invoice for that. We obviously cannot seek reimbursement, something we didn't pay for, but they've been able to keep us supplied. So that's all I have now. Thank you, but I'm not going to let you off the hook with it without a PPE question, even though you <laughs> covered it. <laughs> um, have, have you thought of a plan or have you started to think about if the experts are correct in late fall, early winter, or at some point we see another surge? Um, is there a plan in place to ensure that we have adequate PPA should that happen and we get hit with a second wave? I, I guess from our standpoint and the delivery of service at the fight about the, the answer would be no. We okay. haven't. We haven't purchased or I, I would say over purchased uh, to protect ourselves. It's certainly something we'll consider and, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll sit with, with Chief Paisan over the week and see if our normal supply vendors can begin to, to do that. I, I know we, we stockpiled and, and I don't wanna make it sound like we're hoarding, but in a way we are. We have tens of thousands of gloves only because that was the easiest thing and, and our supply was, was shipping them right through the COVID, uh, the initial phases through March. And we found that like many, masks and gowns became problematic. Uh, but we haven't tried to overstock those. But to your point, if we are looking at um, a plateau here and then another peak, it would certainly uh, be a, behoove us and, and to do our due diligence and make sure we're well protected. But uh, we've been very well supported by the state. My hat's off. I cannot speak highly enough of uh, Jennifer Hopper, the, the, uh, the director of, of uh, HSCM, uh, Homeland Security Emergency Management, Perry Plummer, and all they've worked extremely hard along with Governor Sununu to, to keep us supplied. And, and uh, I hope that will continue, but we will certainly look up to stock up. Great. Thank you. And I'm not uh, in no way suggesting that we hoard, but I just want to make sure that we're prepared um, in the event that there's a, a surge later on in the year. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. A any other questions or comments for Chief Wilkin? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so the, the uh, picture of the plateau is coming because we're doing more testing and the, and the relative numbers of testing to positive cases is getting uh, is evening out. That's why, you know, we're not having a spike in positive cases or, or uh, hospitalizations. But we continue to creep up on the number of fatalities. And I wonder where that plays into the idea that we've reached a plateau and it's okay to go on out. No, I, I think it's interesting. And, and you look at that as well. And, and anybody that follows the news uh, has heard, at least in New Hampshire, it seems like disproportionately to, to some regions, our, our elder population and population of long term care has, has significantly been impacted more than the general population of those of us. So, you know, uh, going to the supermarket and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the the RJs, the supply stores. It's amazing to see the differences. I would agree with you. I, I've been watching every two weeks uh, span we have a meeting. It's about another thousand positive cases, but um, some of the fatalities have been in double digits every day, uh, and and they remind us that they are typically long term care. So yeah, even though so our testing is positive, while our while our uh, our fatalities are are increasing, I think forty five to me. They mentioned um, certainly very low compared to other states, uh, but, uh, but certainly to, to something to keep an eye on. And, and of course, each state uses different parameters to measure progress as far as uh, as the reopening. And, uh, and it, it's a matrix that, that I don't wouldn't even want to begin to, to to try to explain. But there's a number of different ways to show positivity and in, 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 uh, and fewer tests, and I'm sorry, few, few positives and whatnot. But I would agree, Julia, uh, it's uh, problematic to keep looking at some of the fatalities. Today was a zero day. It was a good day. Yesterday was three. Um, but for small state like Hampshire, it's a lot of people. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions, comments? Great. Thanks again, Chief. Um, Mr. Wynnum, good evening. 
Good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, just go right into it. Please. Okay. Let me just back out of this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, start off with kind of a, an overview and then uh, get uh, down to what's going on with the state and then the local economic updates. So I think you all know I work with a fairly large uh, regional uh, group of service providers. And so we're, we're noticing certain things. And one of the things that we're hearing from our businesses is that they're trying to adapt to a future of increasingly finding ways to have employees work from home. The thought process being the more employees that can work from home allows for more social distancing for their colleagues that need to be on site. Businesses are trying to prep, uh, not just in case of a COVID-19 relapse, but also for any future pandemics. So they're trying to basically change their business model. Um, another thing we think might happen is that much like in the late 90s with lean processes, we think there will be a push to assist businesses in implementing social distancing processes in the workplace. Just like the Manufacturing Extension Partnership in New Hampshire will come to our workplaces and teach lean practices, we believe something similar may happen uh, with workplace social distancing in the future. And another thing that we got, we got together and did is uh, the, the several Seacoast area economic developers wrote a letter to the Gopher team in support of using state resources to assist chambers of commerce as they've received no funding and are not slated to. They're a 501c6. Uh, it looked like there was going to, they were going to get some funding, assistance, but the assistance now is in limbo. We argue that chambers aren't only more needed now than before, uh, but this will likely increase once the pandemic has passed and many small businesses won't have funds to market themselves. And chambers are very, very good at that, our chamber, frankly, in particular. Um, the Main Street Relief Fund, uh, I'm sure you all know about this, uh, the $400 million of the $1.25 billion allocated to the state from the feds uh, was for the uh, Main Street Relief Fund. Uh, New Hampshire small businesses except healthcare, childcare, and agriculture that gener generated less than $20 million in revenue during the 2019 tax year, sorry, uh, qualify. Uh, Pre-qualification ended on Friday and a business wouldn't be eligible to apply unless they pre-qualified. I don't know if that will remain uh, an ironclad rule because I had a business call me in a panic this morning because they only happened by my email when they checked their spam folder. The owner was bummed when she read it and then went on to find all my other COVID-19 emails in her spam. So we don't know the parameters yet. They were originally scheduled to be issued today, but that didn't happen. I watched the governor's speech today hoping we would hear uh, program details, but his only comment was that uh, the plan is to release the grant applications to pre-qualified New Hampshire businesses later this week. He, he also noted somewhere around eight, uh, excuse me, somewhere around 13,000 pre-qualification applications. That's what the state received. To me, that seems extremely low. Um, uh, there would be many, many, but probably 10, 15 times that the businesses will qualify. Um, and so we're really kind of wondering why only 13,000 businesses did. Uh, my colleagues and I th are thinking that as far as we know, only Rockingham and Stratford County economic developers pushed for the Secretary of State a good standing list and thus are pushing this information out. It may be many businesses didn't even know about the M MSRF and all the other crazy information coming out. Um, there's just a lot of stuff in the ether and a lot of businesses are busy and they may not have seen that. And so I don't know if perhaps there might be another round or if they'll loosen it up and let more businesses apply because certainly more qualified. Uh, so on a state level, um, Businesses that uh, can begin phasing in or expanding their services today are acupuncture, beaches, health and fitness, uh, massage, and professional body art. Uh, industries that can phase in or expand on June 5th, uh, lodging guidance, excuse me, lodging, and industries that can begin uh, to phase in or expand on June 22nd, as you know, are day camps. Um, all this information will go out in my next COVID-19 business outreach email. I did want to thank a lot of staff uh, that are on this call and all the rest that helped with the uh, extra temporary dining applications. That's been going very well. Uh, so the businesses that did get approved, and I want to point out, there are businesses that didn't have to get our approval. Uh, if, for instance, um, uh, Epic, for instance, if they just continued uh, outdoor dining where they already have outdoor dining, they wouldn't need anything from the town. So this list I'm about to read are, are the ones that came through the town and asked for permission, whether it's on our property or their property, uh, on a space they didn't already serve uh, outdoor uh, dining. So Capital Tie, SARS Brewing, D Squared Java, Donut Love, and his Chocolates, La Solis, Me and Ollie's, Pine Garden, Saw Belly Brewing, Sea Dog, Steve's Diner, Thirsty Moose, and Vino A. Vivo. Um, other than that, businesses are cautiously reopening uh, per the governor's guidelines, and I'm answering, as you can imagine, tons and tons of questions and connecting businesses to the proper resources. So if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. 
Darren, thank you for that report. Any questions for Darren Winham? Okay, I don't see any. Darren, thank you very much for your report and keeping us uh, up to date almost daily with all the progress that you've been making with, uh, with our local businesses. Thank much you so much. Thank you. All right, bye, you guys. Bye-bye. Um, Doreen, did you have anything specifically that you were going to speak to this evening? Oh. I was just here um, in case there were questions on the bonding because I okay. put the package together and work with the attorneys. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mr. Dean, you're up. All right. Um, well, as was mentioned prior, uh, the 15 day extension on the state home order is in place. So June 15th is our next milestone date on that. Um, and I did want to give my thanks to Eric and Doreen uh, for all of their work on pulling together all the documentation we needed for the gopher. That is not uh, an e it's a pretty arduous process. And uh, the packet we submitted was probably 25 pages thick uh, on Friday. So they did a really great job pulling that all of that together, including the backup data. So um, we'll wait and see what the gopher says, and hopefully we'll get reimbursed for the full amount of the 362000 we put in. And uh, that will be good news for the town if that happens. The, uh, the other thing is just acknowledging, Darren, what he said on the outdoor dining. Uh, that's been a long process just getting that in place. And I just wanted to thank all of the team that's been involved in that. James Murray, our health officer, J Jay Perkins, Doug Eastman. Uh, we've really had a great team sort of coalesced around that, uh, working hard to make sure that that goes smoothly. So that's been uh, going very well. And then I uh, just had a couple of more anecdotal things. Uh, one was one of the things that we're noticing with the uh, with the stay at home orders, we're noticing a lot more people jogging mm -hmm. and biking. And just it's just sort of an ask to uh, have people make sure they're conscious of their surroundings. Because I know, even personally, having been out on the road and driving around uh, at different times, you know, you kind of see bikes veering <laughs> into the road and people just maybe aren't quite as conscious as they usually are about their surroundings. So both for drivers and for pedestrians and bicyclists, just really be conscious of, of where you are in your surroundings. Um, and then just the other thing is, and, and I think we're seeing this evolve as a theme, which is uh, families are making decisions for themselves about what they think is safe uh, and what isn't. And I think that makes perfect sense given the conditions and everything that's happening. So I'm sure we're going to continue to see that trend uh, going through the summer and uh, even into the fall, probably in, in that regard. So, um, but by and large, I would say uh, I think everyone on our team has been really on top of everything as much as we can be. And uh, we're going to continue in that vein and town operations are steady. And uh, I appreciate all of our first responders, certainly that are out there on the front lines doing a great job for us. Uh, the trash is being picked up. Our public works department is overseeing the paving program. There are a lot of parks and, uh, and islands and so forth being mowed and maintained. And uh, so we're, we're doing our regular work. We have begun to have those conversations about uh, what the future looks like for us in terms of the municipal buildings and facilities and just the general themes when the time is right. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, the things that we're doing with in people, in-person services over the phone and via internet. And that seems to be going very well. And we want to continue to encourage that. Uh, we've been doing things like marriage certificates. If people need them personally, if they call us, we'll go out and meet them. Uh, as long as we're wearing a mask, they're wearing a mask, and we can be comfortable in that environment. Um, and we are continuing to have conversations about our, our various buildings and, and the state that they're in at this time. And uh, what we may see as a plan going forward, uh, probably in the next month or so uh, on that front. So I'm, ha I'm happy to take any questions the board has on COVID issues. Mr. Dean, I have a comment to that, but first, select woman Gilman's had her hand up, so let her. Okay. Uh, 
Sorry, I had a, a quick question about um, notarizing documents. I've had um, uh, folks who are going to uh, apply to run for state rep and they usually like to do some kind of ceremonial, here's my paper thing at the town clerk's office. Um, mm -hmm. But given the documents need to be notarized, and so my question is, do, do the folks have to go to their bank or something like that? Is notarizing happening at the town office at all? Uh, I will follow up on that and get you a clear answer. I know we have had some FaceTime-based notarizations that have been going on that way, so we have a process, but let me, uh, I will look into that and let you know for sure. Sure, the uh, Secretary of State's office and the AG haven't commented on that yet, so we're all kind of, I know that um, our town clerk is still, you know, says everything needs to be notarized, and so the folks are wondering. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Dean, I just wanted to follow up on, on uh, the reopening of offices, and I know that each town is going to work differently. Um, <clears throat> my client, the Mass Municipal Association, has started very slowly, but started working with municipalities and gearing them ready to open at whatever pace um, that they so choose. Has, has the NHMA reached out in the same regard, or are we getting any uh, are they are they giving any resources for towns yet as to how you may reopen slowly? Uh, not yet, and that's actually a very good question because I think it's been more segmented. Uh, you hear of different uh, places kind of doing their their own thing, so to speak. So that's a good question, Mr. Chairman. I think I'll follow up with them and see if they're working to develop some universal guidance on on that item. It's a good point. Uh, I'll also follow up with if I can be of any help, if you have any specific questions or departments, buildings, if I can be a resource from what I know in, in Massachusetts, I'm happy to help. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are looking at, uh, inter we've, we're doing internal assessments of the building, more than just assessments. I mean, we're in the process of looking at things like spit shields uh, where we can install them effectively. Um, Interestingly, in the town office, one of the challenges we have is the, uh, I call it the alleyway from the front door to the town clerk's office. It's actually a fairly thin, uh, not a large area to move. So we've got some challenges that way, but we're definitely looking into social distancing signage and things like that, as well as discussing like mask use inside the building and what we, we would require of people that are coming in the building to keep everybody as safe as possible. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Dean? Uh, Russ, before we move away to regular business, um, I believe the board needs to discuss and make a decision on Swayze Park and whether or not we want to continue closing it off to vehicular traffic for another 30 days. I think we're, we're up yes. from the last time we discussed this. We are. Comments from the board? I say we leave it closed. I think it's been very successful. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I'll entertain a motion then to extend the closure of vehicular traffic for another 30 days at Swayze Park. I moved. Oh, Ooh. Second popular. <laughs> <laughs> a motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectman Brown. Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. Clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. It passes unanimously. Okay, moving on to regular business. Um, Madam Clerk, I have to have you read again, but we've got a few. Abatements and credits and exemptions. Yes, indeed. Let me just get my scroll down here. Here we go. Um, I move a disability exemption for map 95, lot 64, unit 335, in the amount of $125,000. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Selectman Brown. Aye. 
Slug woman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Slug woman Cowan. Aye. Clerk says aye. Uh, Mr. Chair. Aye. Passes unanimously. All right. Uh, I move to an excavation tax for map 113, lot 5, uh, in the amount of $442. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Madam Clerk. Selectman Brown. Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. Clerk says aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay. Next is uh, intent to excavate for map 135, lot 5. Um, Mr. Dean, we just need to approve that. Right. It's actually map 113. Oh, I'm sorry. Five. <laughs> If that's a piece of paper we need to sign rather yes. than we don't take a vote on this. Okay, um, I move a yield tax for map 46, lot 3, in the amount of $106.31. So moved. Taken. Motion and a second. Madam Clerk? Selectman Brown? Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf? Aye. Selectwoman Cowan? Aye. Chair says aye. Mr. Clerk? Aye. <laughs> okay. Mr. Clerk. Mr. Chair. I was a little over here, but it's okay. <laughs> Passes unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> I voted twice. Yay. <laughs> okay. That's it. Okay. Um, next, we have a voluntary change of address form. Uh, looks like Family Promise has taken ownership of 25 Hampton Road. The residence has been changed from a single family to a two family and the stakeholders would like individual addresses assigned for utility and mail purposes. Uh, in our packet, uh, we have a signed application for a voluntary change of address signed by the treasurer of Seacoast Family Promise. And Mr. Dean, we need to approve this, correct? Correct. Okay. So I will look for a motion to approve the application for voluntary change of address at 27 here. I'm sorry. Oh, that I was going to ask the, the wording would be to change the address of 25 Hampton Road to 27. 27 and 25. It says 25 unit A. No, they want unit A and unit B. Right, 25 Hampton Road, Unit A and B. From 27, okay. Yeah, the mailing address is weird. <laughs> anyway, I move to renumber uh, the units at 25 Hampton Road to 25 Hampton Road, Unit A, and 25 Hampton Road, Unit B for emergency responders to easily locate the property. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Selectman Brown. Was that an aye? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Selectwoman Roundtree Olive. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair. Aye. And clerk says aye. This passes unanimously. Great. Mr. Dean, do you have anything further in your report? Uh, I just wanted Outside to mention. Uh, yeah. I uh, just wanted to mention that um, we're continuing to look into the Gilman Park uh, dog situation and the history there. So that's why it's not here tonight, but um, hopefully we'll be able to revisit that at the next meeting. And um, just wanted to mention the Arbor Day ceremony on May 21st was, uh, and thank Eileen Flockhart who organized that. I know other members of the board were there as well. So that was a nice ceremony in the, in the midst of a pandemic uh, to raise everybody's spirits. And then also just acknowledge uh, Bob Gowacki and Florence Ruffner and others that helped our Memorial Day ceremony. They virtualized it, they did a great job with it. Um, and we're happy that we can and still have that on our website. So if you haven't seen it uh, out there in the public, take, take a few minutes to watch it because it's, uh, 
It was an abnormal Memorial Day this year, but it was a, a moving ceremony uh, nonetheless. So they did a great job on it and just wanted to thank them for that. And that was really it from me. Thank you. Um, and uh, Select Woman Gilman and I were able to attend the um, tree ceremony on Arbor Day and the tree committee did a wonderful job making sure that we were all socially distanced and um, Select Woman Gilman, I think you'll agree it's a beautiful tree and will provide many, many years of shade for our kids at the Lincoln yeah. Street School. And yes, and we did get a little bit of exercise by, you know, shoveling in we the did. dirt to fill the hole and the dirt pile was bigger than the number of us that were willing to shovel in more than two. And I, I will add that you and I shoveled a lot more than Mr. Dean she seemed to keep passing <laughs> the shovel on to the next person. <laughs> right. And that was my only exercise for the week. <laughs> but I would like to say that the tree was a, a Chinese lacewing elm, and it's supposed to be have uh, nice flowers and be a great shade tree. So eventually, uh, I don't know how fast it grows, but eventually over another playground, there'll be a nice shady tree by the buddy bench. Yes. Uh, and, and I did uh, promise from the group that next year we're looking for a native tree, Native American tree. But it was a good ceremony. Mr. Dean, is there, um, has there been any definitive plan to um, uh, display the flag for several days? With I know uh, we had corresponded with Eileen Flockhart. Has she been able to reach you on that? She did. She dropped off the flag today. Uh, we're looking at our options with it. We just want to be sensitive to protocols and things like that. So we're trying to trying to work our way through that right now. Great. Thank you. And one last question on the back to parks. Um, can you just explain to the board real quick? I know we had a quick conversation last week about the uh, the dog sign that was removed from the park uh was it a week or two ago right so uh it was i think it was early last week townhouse common that has mm -hmm. had a sign of, for no dogs for a number of years uh there was some research done and and just like the uh gilman park being part of the the dog ordinance animal control ordinance townhouse common is not named in the animal control ordinance. So uh, that prompted another run at some research about Townhouse Common. And I actually included the deed for Townhouse Common tonight in the board's packet and correspondence. So you have a chance to see it for yourselves and what the uh, restrictions are on the park. And it doesn't say anything about dogs in the deed. And uh, we actually reached out to as many people as we could last week that may have had some history with this. So that's my way of saying to the board, if you know of anybody that, that has some history with it, I, I did email George Olson and actually heard back from him about it, but he couldn't remember any sort of discussion around dogs in the townhouse common. So at this point, we're kind of where we are with that. So um, if anybody knows more, can find out more where we'd love to, we'd love to hear it. One of the interesting outcomes of that was that the townhouse common is actually similar to Gilman park under the auspices of the Southeast land trust, because originally it was under the uh, provisions of the deed were to be uh, enforced by the Rockingham land trust, which of course merged with the Southeast land trust in 2006. So we informed cell of the, of this, and they actually uh, were not aware of it. So they said, thank you very much. And they are reviewing the deed as well. Great, thank you. Select board committee reports. Um, select woman Roundtree Olaf, have you had any? Uh, I have an update. Okay. There was not a meeting, but I received an update that a uh, conversation took place about the need to replace shingles uh, for the pavilion downtown Swayze Parkway. And then there was also a request to consider the possibility of keeping the parkway indefinitely closed to vehicular traffic. So I imagine you'll hear about this again at some point soon. Okay. But that is the update from the Swayze Parkway Committee. Selectwoman Gilman, you have your hand up. Yeah, I actually just uh, on 
<coughs> excuse me, the last thing that uh, Mr. Dean was talking about and to um, add on to Slipman and uh, Roundtree Olaf's uh, comments, we did, the town did ha ha vote to take um, control of the um, pavilion, I won't say pavilion, on <laughs> or, or bandstand, it's got to be something else, uh, only because pavilion is what the bandstand downtown is really named. Um, anyway, the uh, music platform stage the stage in Swayze Parkway is now the town's uh, uh, responsibility and that roof has been needing uh, repair for a number of years and uh, so it should get onto a list it's a fairly small job and an expensive job I think and uh, I and I think it's worth protecting the, the equipment that's there uh, so, so I would talk to we, um, uh, Lovey and I and Dave Short from the Swayze Trustees, and uh, I actually brought Jeff back into the conversation today to get a few quotes uh, working with Dave Short on those shingles. So we do have funds available for that. That's in those those buckets that were set up for the Swayze uh, area. So that's that's what we're looking for for a funding source for that. And what else did I say I wanted to talk about? <laughs> well, you were going to update us on uh, any select board committee uh, meetings and maybe what you've been doing. Uh, no, we had, uh, we had our first um, virtual historic district commission meeting where we discussed the IOCA yep. and it was just a workshop. It was not anything where we made any votes or any, uh, we just discussed what the intent, not the intent, <laughs> what it would be uh, presented as. Uh, the HDC doesn't have any regulatory power over how the building is used, just how the building is treated. Uh, so you can imagine that it has a proposed completely different look and the doc documents are available I think on the planning department's uh, website and then the other event I had was the um, tree planting uh, was very nicely done and uh, there are poems read by teachers for, that were written by students uh, during the their uh, stay at home or, or uh, virtual learning and they're very nice teachers printed them out they're being posted in different stores downtown so it's about how they love trees and and some of them were really very touching um, and i would like to ask mr chair if at some point uh given that we still have a stay at home order for the next um, until the 15th if um we might have a discussion about whether or not exeter wants to go down the road of a mandatory mask ordinance or policy or well, ordinance is more, I guess, what we look for. But for consideration, I don't know how long it would be in effect for. That's one of the questions. If we did it, I have an idea of where we could get some masks. I, I don't think it's something if, that if we go forward with it, it's not something that we should police or not uh, fi uh, induce fines, but we could hand out masks when we find someone. So I would just like that to be on the people's radar if we could talk about it at the next meeting. Absolutely. Other towns have done it um, and been sued. So uh, just to keep that in mind. Um, but it's a, it's a big movement in, in some places that are to require mask wearing or face coverings. And, that's it. and there are some that are there are some who have um, mandated it with a fine, but I know there's one town in particular that I'm thinking of that instead of issuing a ticket for the fine, which is several hundred dollars, the police officer is actually distributing a mask rather than a ticket. So it's not like a you're trying to enforce it with a fine, but just to try to prefer, try to enforce safety. Um, within the environment outside just a thought but uh, certainly we can discuss that at the next meeting is that are these towns in new hampshire that are doing this yes the city of nashua has done it i think portsmouth um i don't know if they've enacted theirs but they're discussing it um i don't know about further further north but uh those are the two that i know of uh that have been successful and it's been the city councils that have taken it up um and i think some of it is pushed from residents is that within the rights of the town, within New Hampshire statutes? <laughs> well, you know, that was my first concern. That's why I wanted to have this discussion next week. Um, the governor has not issued a face covering mandate. 
So I mean, even on a more fundamental level, like towns don't have the authority to. Uh, you are correct, yeah. but then the question is, do we want to stand out from that? Well, if, as a revolutionary capital of, of New Hampshire, <laughs> no, it, I hear what you're saying, Selectman Brown, um, but I still think it's worth a conversation. And I think to select Brown's um, remark, Portsmouth is not discussed, and, I th- and they're still discussing, but my understanding is, is that it's not going to be an ordinance per se. It's going to be a very strong suggestion, um, and I don't think they ha- they're discussing any enforcement. And Mr. Dean, isn't there another town locally that has also drafted something as a strong suggestion, uh, not quite an ordinance, but just a... Right. So uh, the town of Durham is actually uh, through their through their town council. They've issued what they're calling an administrative order uh, regarding cloth face coverings. But when you when you read the actual language of it, what it is, is a I would describe it as more of a policy statement that they're putting forward about what the council is suggesting for people to do. So um, we can get that so the board can see it. It's it's pretty easy to find. It's on their website, but we'll we'll ship it out tomorrow so you get a chance to look through it. Um, but they were, yeah, they were concerned. And the conversation I had with their town manager, uh, they actually consulted with their legal people over there who suggested that they couldn't create something that was uh, binding and forcible through an ordinance, uh, so forth. So they, when they reviewed that, uh, they ended up with this policy statement instead that they're calling an administrative order. So. And, and Nash was in litigation, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Would it be worth getting an opinion from, from Walter before our next meeting? Something in front uh, I don't think that we need to do that. I think, you know, as Mr. Brown has pointed out, this is really is a little more clear. I think whether um, we, the, we're having a policy with the word um, administrative order seems a little bit vague or challenging only in that somebody maybe, and this was maybe their intention to interpret it as an order as opposed to just policy. And then as a, because it's a policy, it doesn't have the teeth that an order you know, an executive order would. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, you pass it by Walter. It's- I, I have a problem with this on a fundamental level. I would like a deeper discussion about a legal, mm-hmm. like, unless we want to revise our license plates <laughs> to say something else. <laughs> yeah, so just no. let's table this for sure. Yeah, I didn't want to bring it up tonight. I would like to have a discussion about it next meeting. <laughs> I think it's worth it's worth a discussion at the next meeting, and we can we can weigh in once we've read what our neighbors are doing, and also uh, hear what Attorney Mitchell has to say. Thanks. So, Select Woman Cowan, since your the box is around you, I'll have you up next for any committee reports. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you heard the result of the part the Rec Advisory Committee. Um, so thank you for being supportive. I'm glad that we're moving forward with some of these social distancing summer activities that I think that they've been incredibly creative in, in putting putting together. Um, the other thing that I had was a planning board meeting um, where we heard the continuation of one of the big properties that's being proposed um, by developer Tom Monahan. So that was a very uh, lengthy and um, very, there was a lot of information to be absorbed, but there were no decisions. We um, are not close to voting on that. Okay, great. That is a big project that started last year when when I was the rep. So, Selectman Brown, did you have any committees? And not yet. I've worked with Russ and Bob to get the um, communications committee going again. Uh, Talk to Pam as well. So she's started that process. Um, and then I'll seek advisement from the board about structuring that going forward. Um, and then I had a really productive meeting with the chief, Chief Poulin, with um, some people from Phillips Exeter, just about um, possibly uh, a pipeline of communicating incidents that the students might experience up the chain from security to police so that we can actually have um, some productive uh, tactical progress on some of the sensitivity issues that are being expressed. Great. 
Uh, and Mr. Dean, we haven't heard because uh, Selectman Brown is also the um, select board rep to the facilities advisory committee. Have they given any indication as to whether they they plan to meet? Uh, no, I haven't heard from anyone on that uh, particular committee yet. Okay. I think everybody else has met. So maybe we could, if we could reach out, I don't know if your office or you want me to reach out or maybe Selectman Brown to just ask their intentions. I mean. Sure. I mean, I think we can. Be a good time. Whatever works best. Happy to, we're happy to do that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. The Selectman Brown, maybe you and I, we can talk about getting in touch with them offline later this week, if that works for you. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, Selectwoman Gilman, you still have your hand up. Did you have anything more? Or, no, just waving to me. <laughs> muted. You're muted. No, I was just lazy. Okay. <laughs> the uh, lower hand thing is way down on the bottom right, but, you know, whatever. Um, okay. Uh, reviewing the board calendar, our next meeting is June 15th, followed by a uh, meeting June 29th. And um, with that, I just want to thank, um, again, continue to thank the town staff for everything they're doing during this crisis. And, um, and also thank all of you uh, on the board um, with whom I have the pleasure to work. It's been a, it's been a rough year. And um, I just want to thank all of you for, um, for serving on the board. It's, it's been a tough year, but thank you. With that, if there are no other comments, um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Don't move. Oh, second. Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectman Brown. Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Selectwoman Cowan. Aye. 